Hello everyone. Today I'm going to show you a beautiful game played by Grandmaster John Nunn with the white pieces. His opponent was Grandmaster Maxim Drugi. This game took place in 1986 in the Carol Khan advanced variation. So John Nunn started out with E4. And, excuse me, that's the French, E6. Maxim played C6, D4, D5, and E5 begins our advanced, advanced Carol Khan variation. The bishop slips out before playing the move e6 and that is one of the differences between the Carol Khan advance and the French advance variation is that this bishop escapes the prison of the pawns after e6 which occurs in the French game continued knight c3 this is a very, very, very interesting move. <clears throat> what are the ideas behind this move? Well, to understand that, it's helpful to understand some of the moves that take place in the Queen's Gambit. So hold this position in mind, and we're just going to go back. I'm going to look at this position. So d4, d5. Now normally we see c4 and this is your king's gambit, queen's gambit, excuse me. And in the queen's gambit, white is offering a pawn in the move c4 and that's why it's called the gambit. And what white is doing here is pressuring black center immediately. And... Usually it goes like e6, and then you get knight c3, knight f6, etc., etc. <clears throat> Queen's gambit. But notice the pressure that white is placing on black center. And this pressure that is placed on black center by the c4 pawn makes it problematic for black in achieving the break c4. And the break e5 for that matter. Of course, black would love to play both moves and totally liberate his position, freeing up his minor pieces. This move c4 causes a lot of trouble. So, for example, after knight f6, bishop g5, we see all kind of attempts black to try to liberate itself c5 one is the terrace but then you run into c takes d5 e takes d5 etc etc and black has this isolated pawn and there's a much theory uh, on that so it's not easy so you get these kind of positions c6 and then Later on, black will try to liberate with c5 after more development and preparation. And sometimes he'll try to get an e5, e5 break. So this move causes a lot of problems. The participation of the c4 pawn in the center. Okay, keep that in mind. And now let's look at this position. So after d4, d5, let's say, uh, I'm sorry, d4, d5, it's white's move. Let's say knight c3. Right, some type of Verisov attack. Knight f6, and uh, let's just throw the bishop there. Now this is the uh, so-called Richter Verisov attack, where... White usually will play f3, followed by e4, and try to control 
the center in a straightforward, if not a crude fashion. It's real obvious. Gives up his bishop for this knight, so that this knight cannot affect the e4 square. And he's hoping to basically blow black off the board. <clears throat> now this usually doesn't, um, doesn't work too well, of course. But um, <clears throat> what I want you to notice, most importantly, is that the knight is blocking this pawn on c2. And therefore, this pawn cannot participate in the fight against black center. And since there isn't enough pressure <clears throat> on black's uh, d-pawn, his liberating moves are easier to achieve. So, for example, knight f3, e6. Yeah, let's see. Uh, let's just throw some moves out there. Bishop f4. Say e6, e3, and move like c5. Black can easily get in, and black black has no problems liberating his position. Now we can question the merits of this position whether black should wait to play c5 after further development, but here black is just fine, even after a move like knight e5. Black would simply just play bishop d6. <clears throat> the point is, is that without this pressure here, white, uh, without white having the pressure on this d5 pawn, black liberates very easily. And this is why you don't see these setups at the higher uh, levels in chess. Okay. So let's look at this Carol Khan position now. So thanks for bearing with me. So again, the game started off e4, c6, d4, d5, e5. The bishop got out of the pawn chain and none played knight c3. And now you see some similarities. You see here the pawn is not able to participate at this moment in the fight against d5. <clears throat> and the knight is right here. So, you might think it's a bad move because it was bad in the other position. But here, there's a difference. Although black wants to get c5 in, he cannot play c5 at this moment. So, this is one of the advantages that white has here is that black is not able to liberate himself at this moment. So for instance, after knight c3, and say he just said, hey, I'm going to play c5 right away. Because actually there's some Karakhan lines where c5 is played quickly. But this knight move makes that move uh, ineffective here. So after, for instance, knight, um, I'm sorry, after c5, one of the moves that black can do Is simply take here right just win the pawn then after say e6 there should be five check is possible let's say at the night d7 right trying to attack both things just play bishop e3 and remember this piece is pinned And white is just pretty much effectively won a pawn. Later on, white will play b4 or a3. So, the liberated move c5 there is premature. So, what's the main ideas behind this move besides stopping c5, the early c5? Well, it's an aggressive move. As you can see, the bishop... And the queen just have to come out and then white will castle queen side. That's one of the ideas. Another one of the ideas behind knight c3. You know, after this, and of course, castle and queen side also 
combined with that is the attack on the vicious attack on the king side. Let me not forget to mention that with G4 harassing this bishop and then followed by uh, H4. So it's pretty, it's a straight up uh, a attacking system. That's one of the ideas. That's probably the most forceful idea in the position. It's basically castling queenside and storming the position. But that idea is, is too straightforward for, you know, really to be effective. I mean, you can, there's ways to play against that, but this is a great idea. And there are some games that none has played like that. But there's some other ideas. Another one is that once, get rid of those arrows. Another one is that once this move is achieved, black has to be careful of the knight coming to b5 since this square is um can become vulnerable so for instance like in this kind of setup here and let's just make a some type of you know dubious type move And we can see that this square becomes problematic because now you have both of these pawns here supporting this knight. Then say after knight e6, and of course you could jump hop right in, or you could just develop because there's no there's no stopping the knight coming in right now. So that's another one of the ideas. It's just not castle and queen side. <clears throat> Okay. The other plan is to play the knight here, keeping this bishop unopposed, of course, but then taking the trip to e2 and then going to g3, attacking this bishop, putting pressure on the king side, and sometimes supporting the f4, f5 advance, and also. Sometimes this knight goes to f4 via e2 also. And those are the basic ideas behind that move knight c3. So let's see what happened in this game. Two strong grandmasters play. Okay, so of course c5 was not played there because it is premature as I said. So after knight c3, Maxim Dugi played h5. And the reason why h5 is played this time is to prevent the move g4. Like I said, that was one of the ideas is to get the bishop and queen out and then castle uh, queen side and then start a raging pawn storm on the uh, king side. So h5 is played not a developing move but just a move to keep this bishop safe from attack at this point John Nunn immediately attacked the bishop going for rapid development he trades the bishop off <clears throat> and now he only has one more piece to get out of the queen side and then he will be able to castle queen side if he chooses. E6 is played and right now black structure pawn structure is pretty decent. Uh, he has this little straggler right here. Well, it's not too bad but he does have to be careful of the weakness created on the g5 square as a result of that that pawn push. Black's other main problem right now is just his lack of, <clears throat> excuse me, his lack of development. You can see all the pieces on the back rank still. So therefore, that will be uh, Black's main object, subject, and project going forward is to get his pieces meaningfully developed into the game. And, of course, he wants to achieve this C5 break. So Black will be working on that, playing moves like Knight D7 you know since he's cramped 
playing moves like knight e7 and going to f5. Sometimes the knight goes to g6, but f5 is common also. And with this pawn here, <clears throat> this is a good square to go to. And the knight from f5 puts pressure on d4. And this bishop often plays some kind of defensive role at e7. Sometimes it goes to b4, but it's more common to go to e7. So let's continue. So after e6, none played a normal move. Knight f3. Maxim played knight h6. And it has the same purpose. And that's to bring the knight here to f5. But this has the added benefit that he leaves the, this bishop open here. Instead of blocking it temporarily. White simply castled. Black played knight f5. Everything according to plan. And now, here's that other plan I was telling you about with this knight. This knight comes to e2. And it wants to come here and get this guy out of there. Black continues his development. With knight d7. Knight g3. And Lugi plays knight h4. And this goes along with the principle of cramped positions. The player with the cramped position wants to trade pieces. And so Lugi facilitates that. Instead of dropping the knight back here to e7, he offers a trade. And it provides a bit of relief to his position. So after queen takes h4, Development continues with bishop e3. And so this is uh, white's um, advantage right now is development, leading development, and space advantage. And let's see what he can do with it. So Maxim, this goes back with the queen. Perhaps he should have just used that opportunity to further his development. Might maybe castle on the queen side. But he decided to go back to d8. And now this allows this pawn to push. And perhaps that's what he had in mind. None plays rook fd1. And what he's doing is fortifying the center. And he's planning to use this pawn now. As we saw in the king, then the queen's gambit. Remember that how powerful that c4 pawn is in putting pressure on this structure and it makes it hard for black because when black plays this move c5 and you have c4 this structure becomes very unstable so let's see so after rook fd1 Rook c8 was played. So we see Maxim, he's developed his pieces um, very well, well in this position. Uh, the best he could. He got rid of, uh, of one of his knights, which gave him some breathing room. And he's playing his pieces um, in right squares. The rook on the c file is facilitating this push along with the knight and along with the bishop. None plays b3. The idea again is c4. Now, perhaps he could have did c4 right away. But he decides to play b3. And I guess in case of takes, he can just recapture with the b pawn and that way no piece can land on d5 for instance this knight coming here and here so he takes the time to use the b pawn to back up the c pawn none play c5 
and which I believe was um, I'm sorry Doogie paid C5 Maxim Doogie has the uh, white pe black pieces none played C4 which is the correct move in this position because the player with the lead in development should strive to open up the position we see that white has the lead in development but as long as the position is closed black can um, catch up in development and black's king is relatively safe but when the position is open the lead in development means everything so c5 may have been a bit premature and it seems to me the mistake of the game perhaps he could have continued on with the move like h4 or something just harassing the knight Perhaps bishop e7. c4 is coming. But once this structure is weakened, because the triangle structure is very strong, this, this, um, what I mean by the triangle is this, this right here. This structure is very strong. But it's, it's like a fixed structure. And once you move one of the pieces, then it becomes a little bit suspect. So right there, this move just shakes this structure to its foundations. So if the C4, <clears throat> C takes D4 was played. And let me just show you if h4 is a nice move that um, there's a beautiful continuation that uh, none could have played if h4 was played. Which is c takes d5, sacrificing a piece, h takes g, g3, d takes e6. And if G takes H2, just simply King H1. And if Knight takes E5, then Queen F5 is very strong, threatening mate. And threatening this Knight at the same time. Taking the pawn and revealing an attack on the queen and again if G takes h2 here the king just simply goes into the corner and white would be winning there so after c4 Maxim played c takes d4 this was meant by another piece offering a brilliant move right here c takes d5 leaving the bishop on priest again if d takes e3 then just simply d takes e6 e takes f2 check and just king f1 and Black is just in a whole world of trouble. There's nothing that can be done here. For instance, just make a real bogus move. If knight b6 trying to save the knight, then just e takes f7 check. And so he tries to stay next to the king. Excuse me, the queen. Then simply queen g6. Leaving the rook facing the queen. And let's say, you know, he tries to get out the way. Queen c7. And knight f5 will just be mate. So just nice, um, nice tactical sequence there to illustrate the superiority of white's position. So after c takes d5, uh, Maxim seeing this and... Notice his pawn could be captured, so he threw in this move. Knight takes e5. So this 
So if the knight takes e5, we saw the move. Queen takes d4. Right now, the knight is being attacked. Now, just take one moment here, people, and look at the development. Look at white's pieces. King is safe. We have all these pieces out into the game. The only, only piece not involved is the white rook right here on a1. Meanwhile, look at black's pieces. Look at this back rank. The rook is developed. And this knight is developed, but just in no man's land right now. And the king is in the middle. That spells trouble. So, after queen takes d4, Maxim went in for the trade of queens, which is natural. If he could trade queens, that would be fantastic. Because black's pawn structure is not too bad. He would be able to survive some type of ending, probably. So, for instance, and he's up a pawn. So, for instance, if the queen takes, e takes, rook takes, f6 would have to be played, and then bishop takes a7. Now, white is still better, and probably will still win with his, uh, his lead and development, but uh, possibly this uh, pawn majority is 2 to 1, but it would be it'd be much more difficult. I mean, this would be like a long, long battle. Black, sh white should be able to pull this out, but <clears throat> there's all kind of uh, additional possibilities for black to hold. And that's probably what uh, Maxim was banking on here. However, Nunn played a simple move here. Almost a beginning type move. That move was just Queen A4 check. Now, the King is attacked. Excuse me. The King is attacked. And the Queen is attacked. So both members of the royal family are under assault. There's only one move. Well, there's actually two moves, but the move played in the game was Queen C6. Natural move, offering the trade of queens once again. Now, you might want to pause the computer, excuse me, pause the video, and try to find out what the good doctor did for his next move here. All right. <clears throat> so John Nunn played a powerful move right here. Rook A C1 bringing the last piece into the game. And I love it because it just shows all of white piece all of white's pieces fully activated and involved. And just finish, finishing off the game by developing another piece. And that was um, that was awesome. Now, let me show you why he resigned. If queen takes a4, then simply rook takes c8. There's no, there's really no getting around it. You know, he entered the pen by defending, which he was forced to do. He entered into this pen right here, and then rook a c1. And of course, he can't move the queen because of the pen. So there's no queen takes rook or anything like that, even though that would still be losing. Bishop c5 just loses the rook takes c5. Because this bishop here is protecting. And you had the same scenario with, you know, queen takes a4 and then rook a8. So that was just a brief 
miniature. I hope you liked it. Um, John Nunn, uh, I think was rated 2586 at the time. And Maxim Lugi was about the same rating, about 2500 maybe 2550 And that game took place in London in 1986. So I hope you enjoyed that game and, uh, you know, got a few ideas for maybe your own games. You know, I try to explain that assault on a deep on, you know, as best as I could. But the thing to remember is the idea with this knight on C3. That's like the main, you know, understanding what goes on with this with this knight. And what goes on with this C pawn as far as putting pressure on the D pawn. So, I hope you like that game. Please uh, like and subscribe. And I will see you soon.